It's not even her kid. Uh, she's, she's passionate about it. Um, justice must be served. It must be done. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. All right, um, so I've, I believe I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again because this kind of frames our, um, it frames a lot of Carrie's and my ministry here at CLF. Um, when we were newly married, uh, Carrie lived on the Navajo Reservation for 10 months, thought that it was just going to be a one-off thing to serve uh, Native people, to make young adult Native uh, disciples. Um, for we, we were engaged. I was finishing up school. She went to go work with this ministry. We thought it was a 10-month thing. Uh, praying about where we were supposed to be uh, in our first steps in marriage. At the end of her 10 months, we were getting married that summer, and then where were we supposed to go? We kept feeling like the Lord was saying that we were supposed to go back to New Mexico, that we were supposed to live in New Mexico, and that wasn't really either of our plans. We had kind of other ideas possibly of what we might do, but that's what we felt like the Lord was telling us to do. And so uh, we moved back to New Mexico together. Um, we ended up spending seven years um, on the Navajo Reservation doing ministry among Native people, um, making disciples with young adults that uh, came in from other reservations, from other places. God opened up some really cool opportunities for us. Um, just some of the most, like, some of the most, they were difficult times, but they were some of the most beautiful times for us, um, serving the Lord that way. And I love uh, what sort of epitomizes um, our, our growing together in marriage and our growing together in our, in our family during those seven years. Our first three children were born in New Mexico um, is this picture um, we actually lived in a camper when we first lived there. Um, I mean, dead broke. That's a really nice camper. It was given to us. I mean, that camper was like, that was, that thing was, it was sweet. If you're going to live in a camper, I would recommend that you live in a nice camper. Um, I don't know that I would recommend. When we came home with Madison and brought her home to a camper, there was a big banner on our camper saying, it's a girl. And um, somebody snapped a picture of this, and it's like, that's the epitome. We, we didn't have two nickels to rub together, um, dead broke, living in a camper. <laughs> it's not quite a van down by the river, but it's pretty close. Um, and uh, started having kids, and then ended up having three kids. Um, you know, it didn't feel risky because we were just too young and too dumb to know how risky it was or, you know, being away from family. Carrie's family was 16 hours away, um, you know, a 16-hour drive. Our family here in Wisconsin was a 24-hour drive away. Uh, we didn't know anybody. Really, all we had were each other and then the people that we were growing in community with there on the Navajo Reservation. And God just knit our hearts together with those people. We still have dear friendships with a lot of those people and um, got to see God do some really incredible things as we, st as we stepped out in faith. Um, it was super challenging um, but we didn't want to leave, and when we ended up getting the opportunity to come back here to be on staff at this church, and we had been sensing for a while that the Lord might be directing our steps in a different way. We sort of felt like our roots were being pulled up from New Mexico, but we didn't know where we were supposed to go or what we were supposed to do, and it was sort of like we didn't know what our next step was going to be, and that's when we ended up getting a phone call from Pastor Dean, um, and we were supported as missionaries by this church family. And so I, I just thought he was calling to check in on how, you know, one of the missionaries that you guys support, how we were doing. Um, he ended up asking if we would pray about considering coming back here to be on staff. Uh, long story short, um, it was not what we expected, um, but, but we felt the Lord saying that we were supposed to come here. And I've shared with you before, we came here to interview. It was um, spring, the snow was melting, and the Wisconsin River was raging. And um, when Carrie and I kept coming in and out of meetings with different people while we were interviewing here, and we were driving along Wisconsin River Drive back to my parents' house in Rapids, and, um, and she said, what are you feeling? And I just said, I feel like we are a log on that river right now, and we don't really get a say in what's happening. The Lord is just leading us someplace whether we want to go there or not. And she's like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm feeling like too. And, uh, and I, I say this with like absolute love in my heart. We did not want to be here. We did not want to come back to central Wisconsin. And I'm not one of these people who grew up here who's like, oh, I hate this stupid town. I can't wait to get out of here. When I get older, I'm never like, I was not one of those people. I loved my child. I loved growing up here. Like I always thought this was a really cool place to live. It had nothing to do with that. It's just, that's not what we pictured in our minds. And so we thought, well, maybe this is just, we're kind of wounded a little bit from ministry. Maybe this is just a couple of years that we're supposed to just get healthy, kind of get our legs back underneath us. And then we're going to head out into something else. 
um, and it just kept going longer and longer and longer and longer. And, and <clears throat> honestly, there was this big part of us that felt like, this is where we were coming from. We lived in a camper. You know, like, we weren't paid by the church that we were working at. We, or they paid very little. I drove school bus in the mornings and in the afternoons, and then in between, I worked at the church. On my days off, I worked construction. It was like, this is just, in the beginning, Carrie waited tables, I delivered pizza. We just kind of did, like, whatever we needed to do to, like, support our ministry habit was basically what we, what we did. And so there was something in us that was like, we knew that we were called to those people and we were called to that place. And it was like, God gave us a burden for indigenous peoples and he opened up opportunities for us to do ministry. And it felt like when we came back here, it felt sort of like, I remember us saying to God, this feels like a waste. Like, I feel like we'll go anywhere and we'll do anything. Like, we'll, and I'm, that's not to brag or anything. And even probably when, when it came down to it, we probably wouldn't, we would double clutch on whatever it was that God called us to. But the bottom line was it sort of felt like we've already lived in a camper. We've already done, like, we're too dumb to know anything different. Like, why would you put us someplace that is like, Middle class, perfect place to raise your family. It was like the position on the staff, people would have killed for that job. People would have come out of Bible college or come out of some other, they would have killed to be a part of this team. And it sort of felt like people aren't exactly lining up to go to Mongolia, God. Why don't you send us to Mongolia? Because we'll go, like, we'll go there. We'll go do whatever it is that you want us to do. Why would you, why would you waste our availability on sending us to, like, tame central Wisconsin and just, you know, whatever, and, and honestly didn't feel like we had any answers on what that was about and just tried to serve the Lord faithfully here going, I don't understand why, but we're just here and we're doing our best to stay faithful. And when, um, when Dean was preparing to retire and uh, the board asked if we would consider, um, you know, putting our hat in the ring for, for this position, and we did and did not think that we would get it. It was honestly like a hey, this would be kind of cool to be a part of this process as long as they're going to, like, look for somebody to replace Dean. I'd love to see what that's like. Let's put, our, let's put our, our name in the ring. And then it was like, and we're giving you the job. And we were like, are you serious? Like, this is not, <laughs> this is not what we were expecting. Again, thought we would be here temporarily. And then all of a sudden it was like, and now we could possibly end up running the church. And, and so we, we asked the board for 10 days to pray and fast and just seek God to go, God, is this what you have for us, is this, is this your agenda? And, and even still, we prayed during that time going, God, I feel like we'll go anywhere and we'll do anything. Why, why here? Like what, why? <laughs> like, I, I, why? And the thing that we felt the Lord say to us really clearly was, you will go anywhere and you are willing to go anywhere and you're willing to do anything and I want the two of you to lead a movement of people who will go anywhere and they will do anything. And we just kind of went like, okay. And it was like the Lord was saying, I don't, one person who will go wherever I'm asking is great, but a movement of people who are willing to risk whatever it is that God is calling them to risk, a movement of people who are willing to leverage whatever it is that God has given them, for the sake of the kingdom, that starts to become an unstoppable force. And we just felt like the Lord was saying, I, this church is going to be a place where I'm going to, and we have a history of this as a church family, but where God is going to continue to build on that history of people leveraging everything they have, leveraging their very lives, being willing to go to tough places to do tough things, whether that's within our own community, within our own families, or whether that's across the world, serving the Lord and whatever it is that he has for us. And so when we, when we are in this position to serve you guys as, as lead pastors, Carrie and I, that is what is in our hearts. What is in our hearts is, Lord, would you raise up a movement of men and women and teenagers and kids who are willing to go anywhere and to do anything. Now, God may only call you across the street. He might only call you into an awkward conversation with somebody locally. He may only call you to, to love somebody unconditionally that's difficult to love unconditionally, or he may call you to sell everything that you have and move to a different culture because that's what he's asking for, for you to do. But our prayer is that we would be people, as Christian Life Fellowship, that we would be people who our lives are held with open hands. We, we, don't, we don't hang on to anything. We don't hold on to any dollar bills in our bank accounts. We don't hold on to any possessions. We don't hold on to any relationships. We don't hold on to anything 
so tightly that we're not willing to say yes to God with whatever it is that we have. That with every fiber of our being, we are open-handed before the Lord, saying, Lord, whatever it is that you have for me, I am yours. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to speak up. I'm willing to shut up. I'm willing to stay. I mean, sometimes what it is that the Lord calls you to is staying someplace that's difficult in faithfulness. Sometimes what he calls you to is sacrificially leaving what's comfortable and going to where it's uncomfortable. Sometimes he keeps you where it is comfortable. Sometimes he leads you to places where it is comfortable and you weren't before. It, this, is not, this is not cookie cutter. This is not one size fits all. This is not, well, whatever it is that you dread, that's probably what God is calling you to. That's not the kingdom of God either, okay? The kingdom of God is faithfulness with whatever God places in your path. And we talked about this at the beginning of this series on, on church history, on how we got here. We talked about that, that, that concept of, of thrownness, like throwing a ball, that we are thrown possibility, that we have all kinds of possibility, limitless potential as human beings, but then we are thrown into a time and a place where we are, we're born. We, I live in this era, not in a previous era, and not in an era to come. This is my generation right now. I have made decisions, then on top of that, I am married to my wife. With each decision that we make, it shifts. Our area of possibilities shift. It shrinks in some ways, and it expands in others. So the fact that I married Carrie, now that shrinks some possibilities in my life. I have a wife, and then I start having children. That shrinks some possibilities, but it also opens up other possibilities that were not open to me before I was married, right? And so in every season of our life, in every facet of our life, we are thrown possibility. It's like there's all kinds of potential, but it's not limitless. And with each decision we make, with each step that we take to be obedient to Jesus, he leads us into different places. And now we have different set of horizons, a different field for us to till and to sow seed in and to water and to reap a harvest. And then God just, each day we faithfully, we take the steps that God calls us to take. We make the disciples that God calls us to make. And sometimes that's right here in central Wisconsin. And you may never leave central Wisconsin. And sometimes he calls us to go around the world to someplace completely different than we ever would have expected. And the, the issue is not one is better than the other to stay here or to go. The issue is obedience. The issue is faithfulness with what the Lord is calling us to. And this doesn't matter if you're a middle schooler in this room right now or online right now or if you are young and single or if you are married, if you're middle-aged, you're empty nester. I mean, I... It doesn't matter what phase of life. This is the reality. This is what we're called to. This is what the kingdom life is all about. And in the kingdom, our primary goal and our primary responsibility is to grow as a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And when you are a healthy and growing disciple of Jesus Christ, you will make disciples. Because that's what a disciple of Jesus does. It reproduces and makes more disciples. And so if we are healthy and we are growing as the people of God, we're going to lead other people into the kingdom. So if we're not leading other people into the kingdom, if we're not making disciples, it's a logical question to go, am I healthy? Am my priorities where they should be? It doesn't matter what our vocation is. It doesn't matter what our giftings are. It's not some people's responsibility to make disciples and others it's not. It's all of our responsibility. What it will look like is different for each of us. Yeah. Where we do it will be different for each of us. How we do it will be different for each of us. But obedience and faithfulness is what you and I are called to. It's what we're called to. And so this morning, I want to talk about our next uh, era of, of church history. And um, it is the, basically the 1700s through the 1900s. And there are two basic common themes that we'll, we'll kind of pull out. And then we're going to take some time this morning and we're going to respond. So um, we're going to take a little bit of time to, to prayerfully, to seek God, to ask him what he has for us in our lives right now. For, you know, if we are thrown possibility, we have specificity to our life right now, but there's also potential. Lord, what are the steps that you want me to take today? What are the steps you want me to take this week? What are the steps that you want me to take in this season of my life? What does faithfulness look like for me in this season, in this era that I find myself? We're going to take a little bit of time to seek the Lord in that way. So um, in the 1700s, uh, 1800s, 1900s, you had a couple of movements that happened. Um, 
basically what you, you ended up having was, as, you, as we look through like the Middle Ages and medieval uh, times, what you had was this, this institutional growth within the church where people, we talked about sacraments, people experienced God through concrete, liturgy, church calendar, these types of things, you know, the, the, the bread and the wine, baptism, coming back over and over again to the sacraments, to ways that we, their windows into a spiritual reality, um, and we see into that spiritual reality, and we receive from that spiritual reality through those windows of the sacraments, right? And so people, people got very set in these pragmatic ways of encountering God, worshiping God uh, through liturgy, um, memorizing scripture in those ways. Then we had the Reformation that brought about this resurgence of the prominence of God's word and how important God's word is. And we talked about um, there was a resurgence with the, uh, with the Reformation about um, the, the difference between clergy, like vocational leaders within the church, and the laity, just normal people, that in the Reformation, uh, they sought to reform the church to make it so there wasn't such a gap between, that was one of the areas of the Reformation that actually didn't really stick very well. We still have that mindset too much where there's, the leadership is here, and well, those are the real rock stars, those are the real superheroes, and then we're sort of like, and maybe I'll bring something to the table if, you know, if God chooses to do it, when that's, that's not the reality. God is intention, his intention is to work through each of us. So the Reformation saw this like resurgence of the word and the, the, the resurgence of this idea that we're all supposed to be used within the kingdom. And what ended up happening in the 1700s, uh, mostly in the United States and then in England, uh, but there are other places in Europe where this was happening as well. Uh, but this is where there was kind of the, the locus or the focus of some of, this, uh, some of these changes. Um, you had this rise in this idea that, that following Jesus needs to be more than just attending church and participating in the sacraments and participating in the liturgical calendar, um, even assent to specific creeds within the church, like the ancient creeds that people use to dictate their faith. Those are important disciplines, but things began to shift in the church to where people went, that's important, but the problem with some of those things is they can remain formal. Now, like, we, we've all grown up in a place where there's pretty strong heritage of formal religion around us, right? I mean, it's pretty hard to, you can't, you, can, you can't throw a rock in central Wisconsin without hitting somebody who was raised Catholic or was raised Lutheran, right? Strong, traditional, religious backgrounds. It's kind of a part of the fabric of our culture, of, of who we are. And so we know that this is true. This isn't always true across the board, but it can be true that sometimes some of those types of practices can stay, they can stay formal, and they can lack a personal experience within those liturgical structures, within those formal religious structures. Now, again, that's not across the board, but for a lot of people, that's part of it. Yes, I'm, I'm entrenched in some of these religious expressions, but I haven't personally experienced that. I haven't, it's, it feels formal, and I feel somehow detached from it, like I'm an observer of what's going on spiritually, not like I'm an active participant of what's going on spiritually. And in the 1700s, this started to get kind of stirred up. And so uh, it, what was birthed out of this is what we know as evangelicalism. And a core tenet of evangelicalism is that um, outside of just a, a formal intellectual ascent of religious truths, spiritual truths about Jesus— and it's not denying the validity of the sacraments or any of those things, but in addition to that, there needs to be an emphasis on the importance of personal experience and a heartfelt response. And so, yeah, you can have religious structures, you can have sacramental observance, you can have a liturgical calendar, you can have all the structure that we have. But in addition to that, there needs to be some sort of a heartfelt response in response to an experience, an encounter with Jesus. And this was, that, like, this was pulled from Scripture. Acts chapter 2, the first time where the church rolls out into the streets, baptizing the Holy Spirit, and people gather around like, these people are nuts, they must be drunk, and they're like, we're not drunk, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, that's not what's going on here, God's doing something here, and Peter preaches this powerful message, and what happens at the end of the message? The people that hear his message, they have an encounter with God, and they say that they're, it says in Scripture that they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. It was not just a mental ascent going, you know what, he raises some valid points. Maybe we ought to live like this. It was like, no, there was, 
there was something deeply personal and deeply spiritual that was happening, and then they cried out, what, what do we need to do in response to this? We're cut to the heart. What do we need to do in response? And then Peter's like, you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to declare that he is Lord. You need to accept his forgiveness. You need to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And so pulled from that is this concept of at some point, you can be around religious structures, but at some point, God has to grab a hold of you and you have to allow yourself to be seized by him. At some point, our hearts have to be stirred in a way that we didn't just intellectually make. Now listen, you can be led to Jesus in an intellectual way. God uses our minds. He works through our minds. He gave them to us for a reason, right? There are all kinds of ways we can come to this conversion point. In fact, it's a process for most people, it's not just, yeah, one day all of a sudden a switch got flipped. Usually somebody's sharing the good news with you over time. They're leading you through scripture. They're leading by their example of their life. You're hearing the truth. There's this process of you being led to this encounter with God. But at some point, there is a radical encounter with God. Sometimes it's dramatic. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's thoughtful. Sometimes it's a combination of those things. It can be sudden. It can be drawn out. What truly matters, though, is not how people are converted, but that they are converted. And that word conversion or converted, that's not in scripture, but we have words in scripture that are used that are, their conversion is a derivative of those words. Probably the two most important ones uh, would be repentance. Repentance speaks to a change of heart, mind, and direction. So it's like, I used to be moving in this direction, but then I repented, and I'm not moving this way anymore. I'm moving this way. And it's not just that I'm choosing to walk in this way. It's that my mind and my heart are actually moving in this direction. I don't want to be who I used to be. And so I'm, my mind, the way I think about life is actually not moving in this direction. It's moving in this direction. And my heart is not moving in this direction. It's not like I'm, I'm going here with my body because I know that that's what I'm supposed to do because God tells me that that's right, but my heart's really over there, right? Repentance is this wholesale change of my direction in life. My heart and my mind are included in that. And that's repentance. That's all over scripture. Um, the other term that's used that conversion would be a derivative of is new birth. Uh, so this idea that there is a kind of second uh, coming to life, and this time it's spiritual. I had a physical birth, but then I had a spiritual new birth. It's the story of Jesus meeting with Nicodemus, one of the religious leaders of his time, and, and Nicodemus is asking Jesus all these questions, and Jesus is like, listen, you need to be born again. And unfortunately for Nicodemus, he was the first person to ever hear that phrase, uh, ever in the history of humanity, and so he was scratching his head going like, I don't understand. I'm supposed to get in my mother's womb, and I'm supposed to be born again? How is that possible? I'm a grown man. She's not very healthy. Like, this is not going to happen. You know, whatever, and it's recorded for us in scripture, and we all read it and kind of go like, oh, Nicodemus. You know, he had no idea. This concept, it was totally new, and it was Jesus bringing to life this idea that, yes, you are born physically, but there is a spiritual rebirth that needs to happen in all of us. And evangelicals in the 1700s came to this place of going, there's an awakening that needs to happen inside our souls. There is a new birth that needs to happen. There's repentance that needs to happen. And so you have all of these uh, people began to have these radical encounters. They might have existed within the religious structures for their entire life. But for some reason in that moment, God began to stir up a hunger for a deeper experience. And out of that experience, they responded with their lives. They converted to following Jesus with their whole heart, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in the 1700s, you had this, and again, this is happening in the United States. This is happening in England. It's happening in some parts of Europe. You had this... Um, resurgence of uh, this passion within Christianity where people were passionate to follow Jesus. They were passionate about what the Lord had done in their lives, and they were willing to give up anything to follow him once again. And so you have um, all kinds of moves that happen. You have, this is where the Moravian church was birthed. Um, this actually came from a guy, his name is uh, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. Real easy name uh, to say. He had a couple middle names in there too that I'm just leaving off. But uh, Count, Count von Zinzendorf, okay? He was born to a privileged family. He's a count. He felt that he needed to sell everything that he had. He ends up pulling together this community kind of similar to what we learned about with the desert fathers and the desert mothers and the early monastic communities. And in Germany, he ends up pulling together this crew of people who were wholesale set on following Jesus with their whole lives. And they, they, 
They committed to living in community together, uh, praying to ask God to spread this good news that they were experiencing about who Jesus was, that he would spread it to all of the world. And so they, they spread it throughout their community. But then they started feeling the stirring for there is more than just our community. There are all kinds of people all over the world that don't know who Jesus is, and they need to know who Jesus is and experience what we've experienced. And so they ended up sending out missionaries. Um, you end up having this, uh, what's known as the first and second great awakening within the United States and within parts of Europe, um, where you have all, you know, Jonathan Edwards, great theologian from the United States. You had um, on the East Coast within the colonies, the, the British colonies at that time, you had this resurgence within the church where people were not just going through the motions, but God was grabbing hold of their hearts and they were being raised to new life through the power of Jesus Christ. They were not who they were before their conversion, after their conversion. They were different people, different people. And then you have uh, the Wesley brothers, John and, and Charles Wesley. And actually, John Wesley was on his way over from England. They wrote most of the hymns. And that's the easiest way to describe them. They wrote most of the hymns that, that are traditional classic hymns that we sing. Um, John Wesley actually ran into some Moravian missionaries uh, on a ship. John Wesley was on his way to the United States to check out what was going on with this like great awakening where things were happening within the church because he had heard. And he had this encounter with Moravian mission, missionaries and it rocked him to his core. He didn't understand their devotion. He didn't understand the power of their conversion, the power of their experience, and it made him seek God for something deeper than what he had. And he marked that point as a result of meeting those Moravian missionaries. He marked that as a turning point in his relationship with Jesus, and um, God used them um, in Europe. So anyways, you have all these awakenings that are happening in the 1700s and in the 1800s. And then out of those awakenings, you have the second movement out of conversion. You have this movement towards the risk of pioneer missionaries. And you had women and you had men who were basically coming to this place where they were, they were understanding what God was doing in them, he was wanting to do in others. And if he's wanting to do that in others, how is that going to happen in other people unless they're told? and explained the good news of Jesus. So let me, let me read to you uh, a couple of scriptures here. Revelations chapter 5. This is, during this time, what was happening within the church is they were looking at w what was motivating them. Because you end up with these missionaries that took massive risks. I mean, at the beginning of the movement when travel was, was not easy at all, you literally had people who would pack all their belongings into a coffin and they would use their coffin as their, their luggage. And they would board onto ships with all of their possessions in a coffin because where they were going, they knew they were going to end up dying there. Whether that was a quick death, because they were going someplace where they were hostile towards uh, other people coming in from outside cultures, or whether it was a death later on down the road, but they were never going to make it back to their homeland because they were going to plant themselves in these countries in order that the good news of Jesus would be shared. I mean, incredible risk. Their immune systems weren't set to take on the illnesses that they would face in some of these other countries, and so sickness and death were pretty much imminent there. I mean, you took on all kinds, if you had families, you're taking children into those environments. Like this is, they were taking on risks. They were getting rid of all their possessions. They were signing on to a life of poverty. They were signing on to a life of being marginalized. They were signing on to a life of what happens many times, and if you guys know Jonathan uh, Ferrant, the missionary that we partner with in El Salvador, he was raised as a missionary uh, kid, um, and he says this all the time. He's like, I feel like I don't have a home. Like, I was raised in Guatemala, and so I speak Spanish fluently, but I was raised as an American. I speak English fluently, but I don't feel like I speak either of them well. I don't feel like either one of them is my, my primary language. I just feel like I sort of stand between these two worlds, and he's like, and I feel like I'm at home in Central America because that's where I've lived the heavy majority of my life, but then, but America is my home. He's like, but I don't feel like I fit in either place. It's like I'm a foreigner in both of those places. Missionaries were signing up for that kind of a life, going, I will live in Africa, but I'll never become an African, and I'll be in Africa, and I'm actually British, or I'm actually American, but I'm not actually going to feel like an American because I'm not actually a part of what's going on in America or a part of what's going on in Britain or wherever they happen to be coming from. And they sign on to these kinds of risks. And this is why, okay? This is why. When you read the end of the story in Revelation, you read the end of the story, and this is what it says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. 
There's a whole lot of context to this that we can't get to, but here's what it says in verse 9. It says, this is a vision that John um, was having of heaven, of the end times, of how the world was going to come to an end, of how um, the new heaven and the new earth was going to come, how the kingdom of God was going to be realized in its fullness, what it would look like for the work of Jesus to finally be completed, right? This is what John is, is picturing, and this is what he sees. One of the things he sees, he says that they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. They're singing this to Jesus, and you'll hear this imagery of Jesus being the lamb who was slain for our, uh, for our salvation, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God. That's redeeming. That's, redem that's redemption. It's redeeming back. You purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And a couple chapters later, he says, and after this I looked up and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They were saying amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. And in this generation of the church, they were looking at, this is the end of the story. At the end of the timeline, there will be multitudes from every nation and from every tribe and every tongue, and yet there are multitudes of nations and tribes and tongues that don't know anything about Jesus. And how will it get to the place where one day the throne is surrounded with people from every tribe and language and nation crying out with all their hearts, you are worthy, O oh God. You are the lamb that was slain. Glory and honor and power to you. For How will we get to that point if we just stay living our lives, doing our thing within our own circles, and we never ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to go? Do you want me to go? And in Romans uh, chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so you had a generation of people who went, Lord, in order for that to be fulfilled in the end, there are steps that need to be taken now to see that happen, and I will do whatever it is that you ask of me to do. I will sacrifice whatever it is that you ask of me to sacrifice. I'll be willing to let go of comforts and preferences and prestige. I'm willing to let go of that. And I'll do whatever it is. You read in Revelation John's image of Jesus, his image of the throne room of God and the praise. There's a reason why everyone's falling on their face before God, worshiping passionately because God is worthy of it. He's worthy of it. And he's worthy of our sacrifice. He's worthy of our surrender. He's worthy of us letting go of the control of our lives. Now again, 
I don't know what God is going to call each of us to, but I know the kinds of people he's called us to be. I don't know where God may or may not send you to. I don't know what the steps of you being faithful to Jesus might look like, but I know who he's calling you to be. He's calling you to be a man or a woman who holds their life with an open hand and says, Lord, here am I, send me. If that means sending me across the alley, send me. If that means sending me to my, there's a missionary, Mary Slesser, who ended up doing amazing things in, in Africa, in the country that's now Nigeria. I mean, amazing things. She, was, she got radically saved. She was working in a factory in Scotland. They were broke. Her father was an alcoholic, and she died, he died when she was a child, and so she had to quit, like, drop out of school, work in a factory, horrible conditions. She, was, she referred to herself as a wild lassie before Jesus, and then Jesus got a hold of her through a family friend who felt compelled to share the good news of Jesus with her. And as a result of that, for 14 years, she worked faithfully in her factory and asked the Lord to do a work in her in the factory that she served in and do a work in her in her local community and in her local church. And as she served faithfully and watched God do work in her factory and in her local community and local church, God began stirring up her heart for a certain portion of Africa that was starting to gain some notoriety for being violent and dangerous and disease-riddled and not a whole lot known about it, but that there were a lot of people there that didn't know Jesus. And God began stirring her heart over the course of 14 years. Her brother's heart was being stirred as well. He was actually signed up to be a missionary to go there, and then he fell ill and wasn't able to go. He died a couple months later. And when his spot opened up, she stepped up to the missionary organization and said, I'll go. Send me. Take me. And they sent her, and she ended up spending the rest of her life, another like 50 years in Nigeria, reaching unreached people groups with the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know what your life will look like, but I know the kinds of people he's calling us to be. He's calling us to be the kind of people who say, here I am, Lord. Send me across the alley. Send me to my shift in the mill. Send me to my family members. Send me to whatever. It might be a short-term mission trip that you're being called to. It might be a group of, of people, a people group or an ethnicity or a nation that you feel God stirring up in your heart and you're afraid of where that might lead. And I want to tell you, you can trust God. God may be calling you just to be an intercessor for those people or for that nation. He may be calling you to support missionaries who are going to go vocationally to that place and to those people, or he may be preparing your heart to do something long-term in that place and with those people. We don't know, but all we know is that we're supposed to be faithful with what God is giving to us right now. That's what we know. We find ourselves in this spot where there is, if you follow Jesus, you are automatically enrolled in doing kingdom work. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that therefore if anyone is in Christ— the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That's conversion. And then he finishes his statement, he says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, that's still conversion, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. None of us receive reconciliation from God and with God in order to just sit on it. Every single one of us receive reconciliation from God and with God in order that we would then have the mantle of the ministry of reconciliation placed on us in whatever context God happens to call us to. And so the challenge is not, oh, will you go to Africa? Will you go to the Amazonian jungle? Will you do these? Sure, maybe it will be those things, but just will you be willing to be used by God however he is calling you to be used? Will you be willing to leverage in the words of our values with extravagant generosity to give towards kingdom purposes greater than just our own life and our own personal fortune? Will we be people who understand that everything we have and everything we've been given, it is for the sake of the kingdom of God? So we're called to be people who are available to whatever it is that God wants for us. We're called to be engaged in in reaching the nations in the way that we give of our finances, in the way that we pray and intercede for people around the world, in the way that we go even in short-term missions trips. We're also called to engage missionally every day in our lives. Faithful, obedient steps each day. So here's what we're going to do right now. Um, we're going to have some sheets of paper across the platform here and some pens. Um, and I want us to take the next five minutes, 
And I'm going to invite you. We're going we're gonna to play a song. And um, there's a, it's a song by a missionary organization that my kids are actually a part of right now. Um, and I love, I love the words of this song. It's so powerful. Uh, it's called a missionary anthem. Um, listen, listen to these words. It says, For the Lamb has conquered, I will follow him. To the ends of the earth, yes, I will follow him. Jesus, you are worthy of every tribe and tongue. It's all for your glory till every soul is one. The harvest is ready. We have to go. We won't stop till the whole world knows. The power in your blood to save every soul. We're not ashamed of the gospel. And this is the part that gets me. I will preach the gospel. I'll die and be forgotten as long as you get the glory. And every time I listen to the song, and most of the time I'm praying for my kids, every time I listen to the song, I get this image of hundreds of young adults in this missionary school crying out with their whole heart, I will preach the gospel. I will die and be forgotten as long as you get the glory. And I picture that and I go, God, will you do that in the church? Will you do that in the capital C church? Will you do that in, in CLF? Will we be people who will say, I'll, I'll preach the gospel, I'll live the gospel, I'll die and be forgotten, is whatever, as long as you get the glory, God, that's what I'm concerned with. And so what I want us to do is, um, as these sheets of paper are going to be spread out, we're going to play that song, and I want you to take some time to, to pray. I want you to we're saying that it's faithfulness in what's your step today? What does that look like? And so I'm going to have you take a step out to come up and get a sheet of paper to grab hold of a pen. And then I want you to find a spot in this room to pray and to take these next few moments and just say, Lord, I'm available. Are there names that you want to bring to my mind that you want me praying for, that you want me to share the good news with? Are there steps I need to take? Like maybe I don't know how to share the good news and I need to learn how to do that. And so a step for me is I need to learn how to do that. I need to learn how to share my experience with Jesus. Maybe for you, you actually haven't had a conversion experience. You haven't actually had an encounter with Jesus. And maybe for you this morning, it's gonna be you saying, Jesus, I don't wanna just sit and participate and be around religious things, but I wanna experience you and encounter you and I wanna surrender my life to you. Maybe that's the step for you. Maybe it's God giving you a nation or an ethnicity or a, a people group that he's going to bring to your mind and you don't know why he's bringing it to your mind, but you're going to write it down on the sheet of paper and you're going to begin praying, asking God, Lord, what is it that you want to do in and through my life regarding these people? I don't know what you're going to write on the sheet of paper, but let's be people who are not only willing to be used by God, but we are hungry to be used by God. We can't think of anything better than being used by God, and we can't think of anything worse other than living our lives for our own ends, for our own purposes, and missing out on the opportunity to join Jesus in what he's up to in the world around us. So they're going to go ahead and roll the song. We're going to have these sheets of paper laid out, and I'm going to encourage you. We'll, we'll dismiss in a few minutes, but I'm going to encourage you, get up, grab a sheet of paper, grab a pen, and let's spend some time in prayer.